My great-grandfather was J.L. Ingram from Coleman, Texas. In his younger years, he was a professional baseball player when it didn't pay very well. He lived to be almost 100 years old. When he was in his 90s, I was sitting on the porch, just a kid, playing, and I suddenly stopped and started staring at my great-grandfather. And he said to me, I know what you're thinking, Dan. You're thinking that I'm old. You know, I thought he was magic or something because that's exactly what I was thinking. He said, but it seems like yesterday that I was your age. Some things stay with you. I sort of doubted what he was saying then. I don't doubt it now. I understand about the brevity of life. There's a verse that will begin our reading today in 1 Peter that says the end of all things is at hand. Peter was talking about the return of Jesus and the end of history as we've known it. Some would say, well, he was mistaken. I'm not saying that, but some would say that. But the reality is, if you piece together around 20 lives, all of which feel like their lives have been short, you're back at the time of Jesus. And Peter himself would write in his second epistle, The Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Some would count slackness, but He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But I think one of the wisest things I ever heard to answer the question about all of the references to the return of Jesus that were shared by Paul and Peter and others was to say, friend, when your life is over, He's already come for you. And we all live with Jesus at the door. At any moment, we could be in His presence. I invite you today back to 1 Peter chapter 4. And let me say from the outset how I appreciate Terry Land sharing with us last week those early verses in the fourth chapter of 1 Peter. But I want to pick up today by simply sharing with you some things about how I think about this particular chapter. I, I think that the verse, verse 2 verses challenge us to realize that knowing that the end of all things is at hand, we should live a committed life. And then also, because the end of all things is at hand, we should live a self-controlled life in verses 3 through 6. I was thinking about that committed life that was so beautifully shared with us and summarized last week. And it occurred to me a song that I've sung since I was a child. Before I could read the words in the hymnal, I had learned the words to living for Jesus. Do you know it? Living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please Him in all that I do, yielding allegiance glad-hearted and free, This is the pathway of blessing for me. O Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee, for Thou in Thine atonement didst give Thyself for me. I own no other master. My heart shall be Thy throne. My life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for Thee alone. Thomas Chisholm wrote that to describe a committed life to Jesus Christ. A life that every waking moment is conscious that Jesus Christ has purchased that life through His shed blood on the cross. A life that, certainly not sinlessly perfect, is nevertheless a life devoted, a life dedicated, a life given to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ought to live that kind of committed life life. May I also remind you that he follows that by talking about how the world around us thinks it's strange that we don't live like they do. They will often ridicule us because we have certain values that we stand by. 
And with that, let me pick up at verse 7. And that's where our key phrase comes from, from which the title of this message has been derived. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Because the end of all things is at hand, we need to be practicing a life of prayer. He speaks about self-control and sober-mindedness, having a mind that recognizes the difference between the frivolous and that which is of great value. A life that focuses on the things of God. A life guided by the Word of God. We are to be that kind of person. And we need that because if we do not live like that, our prayers will be hindered. In fact, our prayer life will be deficient. We cannot commune with God in prayer when we are distracted by the things of the world and when our minds are clouded with worldly things. You know, I was thinking about how can, how can I stay near to the Lord? And there is no better way than in the word and prayer. When I pray, I enter into the presence of the Lord. My focus of my prayers ought not to be the things that I desire from God, but my desire simply to be with God. And somewhere in the periphery are the things that I need. But the focus of my prayer should be the Lord Himself. You know, I've been preaching on Wednesday nights. And there are a few of us who come on Wednesday night. In case you didn't know it, we still have Wednesday night services. I'm teasing. We have a lot going on here on Wednesday night. But I've been preaching through the prayer life of Jesus. And it is obvious that Jesus was a person of prayer and that He taught diligently about prayer. The Gospel of Luke is preeminent in that particular study. The thing that I want to say, if Jesus needed to pray, and He obviously knew that He needed to pray, how much more do you? And how important is it that we be people of continual prayer? The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. Now that doesn't mean stay on your knees all the time with your eyes closed. It means always have an attitude of prayer because an attitude of prayer will protect your heart and mind from so many destructive things and will guide you in the ways of God. Some years ago, there was a song that was sung by Linda Randall. Linda Randall, if you don't know, is a part of the Gaither music and all of those kinds of things, often been a guest with them. But she sang a song. Some days drag and some days fly and some days I think of the day I'll die. Some days fill me and some days drain but one day Jesus will call my name. One day Jesus, if you know it, join me, will call my name. As days go by, I hope I don't stay the same. I want to get so close to Him that there's no big change on that day that Jesus calls my name. Oh, you know, I can't get that song out of my head. I can't get that song out of my head. I find myself singing it in the evening. I find myself singing it silently in my mind as I lay in my bed. Because someday Jesus will call my name. You know how I can keep that from being a stark surprise? By being a man of prayer. By spending so much time with the Lord in prayer that when He calls my name, He's just answering the conversation we've been having For a long time. Henry Blackaby said, God speaks through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal Himself, His purposes, and His ways. Prayer is not a one-way communication. It is not only our speaking to God, it is God speaking to us. And we should let nothing keep us from a vital life of prayer. Ah, but there's more. Look at verse 8. 
Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Not only a life of prayer, but a life of loving service. You know, I was thinking about that matter of love covering a multitude of sins. On the one hand, Jesus, through his death on the cross, covered a multitude of my sins and a multitude of your sins as well. And that particular word is telling us that just as He has covered our sins through His shed blood, we need to have the kind of grace from God that we can cover others' sins. Not that we can forgive them, that's God's business. But we cannot be a grudge-holding person who is continually angry and frustrated and irritated toward others because as God has forgiven us, we have a heart of forgiveness. You know, I love in 1 Corinthians 13, that description in verses 4 through 8 of love as God sees it. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It's not arrogant or rude. But there's a phrase in the NIV in that particular translation. I was preaching at a wedding on one occasion, and I shared this phrase from that description of God's love. Love keeps no record of wrong. There was a man there at the wedding who was so gripped by that phrase, not because of what I said, but because of what the Holy Spirit had to say to him, that he called me from his office the next day and asked if I would come to his office. He wanted to discuss with me something that I had said at a wedding that he had attended that weekend. I'd noticed him in the crowd. I went to his office and he said, where did you get That business of love keeping no record of wrongs. I said, well, I got it out of the Word of God. And I opened up God's Word to him from 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8, and showed him that particular translation that love keeps no record of wrongs. We live in a world where people keep long lists of wrongs, where they constantly want to judge, discredit, and dismiss those that they believe have committed wrongs. God's kind of love keeps no record of wrongs. That doesn't mean it's naive. It just means that it doesn't hold grudges. The man was converted on the spot by a single phrase in the Word of God. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Not even a gospel verse. But God can use whatever He chooses to use to change a life. Before I leave that subject, let me tell you that I was in Australia preaching when my father passed away. And in those days, rarely did we wait very many days for a funeral. And my mother told me long distance from from Texas to Sydney, Australia. She said, Dan, I know your dad always hoped you might go to Australia And you just stay there and preach the gospel. We'll go ahead and have your dad's service. And when you get home, uh, we'll have a gathering at his grave. Oh, Oh, that was hard. We had a wonderful week that week. It was shortly after I'd come to Georgetown. I got to preach in ten churches in a seven-day period. And, And I want to tell you that when I got home, my mother said, I have reserved for you that you would go with me and pick out a headstone for your father's grave. And we went to a place where they sold beautiful headstones. And when I looked at the headstone there, my mother said, What scripture, Dan, would you like to have chiseled on this stone? I said, Mom, that's easy. 1 Corinthians 13, 8. Love never ends. Have you ever really thought about that? God's kind of love never ends. Ends. Now, some English translations say love never fails, but I prefer the translation love never ends. God's love for us never ends. And our love is to be a reflection of His love. Oh, from time to time in life, I've had people say to me, Well, I just don't love my maid anymore. It's all I can do to keep from saying sometimes, Did you ever? Or did you just love yourself? Because love, God's kind of love, never ends. It never 
ends. So if you were to go with me to my mother and dad's tombstone, you would see prominent on that stone, love never ends. Then we look at a list of spiritual gifts. Now remember, we're talking about love here. That love covers a multitude of sins, but very readily he goes into spiritual gifts. It speaks to me of the fact that our spiritual gifts are actions of love. That we do something when we love. It's not just an emotional feeling. It is something that is a driving force in our life. And the Holy Spirit gifts us in a variety of ways to express the love of God. And so let me go back to our text. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I want you to see. I want you to see quite clearly that these spiritual gifts of which the Scripture speaks are expressions of the love of God through flesh and blood human beings such as we are. You can find the various lists in 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians chapter 4, and Romans chapter 12. But I want you to notice that the gift of hospitality is mentioned in the context of the spiritual gifts in Romans. My favorite definition of the gift of hospitality is friendly space. It may be having people over to your house, or it may just be saying to somebody, won't you sit by me? It may be simply listening carefully when people speak to you. It may be just caring for people and them knowing that you care for them. But in this particular context, it is important to know that there weren't a lot of hotels in those days, hardly in at all, and they were notoriously bad. So the early church was constantly keeping itinerant preachers and ministers, apostles and others in their homes, and they were challenged to be hospitable to them, to receive them into their homes as an expression of their faith in the Lord. In one sense, there's such a thing as someone with a gift of hospitality, and I don't think you would have to think very long to remember somebody who has that gift. They continually are opening their home to others. They're constantly bringing people into their home and blessing them and ministering to them with what they have. But notice it's not merely a gift. So you can't say, well, I just don't have that gift. It is also a command. We're to show hospitality to one another. We're to be people of hospitality, reaching out to and caring for others. Notice the other gifts that he mentions here. He says that those who speak are to speak as oracles of God. Now, that doesn't mean prideful. It just means seeking to say those things that are true to all that you've come to understand in the reading of the Word of God and in your times of prayer as you earnestly sought to understand the truth of God. Have you ever heard somebody that when they spoke, You almost had to say to yourself, I'm not sure I'm going to listen to this. There just didn't seem to be any fervor or any passion or any power in what they were saying. This text is saying that if you are gifted to speak or teach, if you're gifted in communication, then do it as one who has passion, one who is speaking with purpose. God somehow wonderfully moves Through the preaching of the word. The Bible says the preaching of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. But those of us who believe it is the wisdom and the power of God. One of my all time favorite stories about Charles Haddon Spurgeon was a time when he was testing the acoustics in the crystal palace that had no public address system of course. And he walked in and he simply said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And when he heard his voice fill that vast room in London, England, he thought, okay, I can preach here. 
a man was working in the rafters trying to repair a leak in the roof. He couldn't see and almost fell when he heard that voice. He clambered down from the rafters to try to find out who had said that, came that evening to the gathering and trusted Jesus and told Spurgeon, I was converted when you said Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's why we speak as the oracles of God. Not because of us, but because God speaks powerfully through His Word. And so these gifts are to be done in love and they're all to be done for the glory of God. Now this is an extremely short list found in 1 Peter chapter 4. But it stands for all of the spiritual gifts that we could speak of together. And each of those gifts are acts of loving service. They're not to build us up, they're to build up the body of Christ. To strengthen, to bless, to encourage those who would follow Jesus. There's a sudden turn in the passage after that. It says in verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Interesting, that's in the list. A busybody, some of the texts are translated in that word. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? I want to pause there and let me say a couple of things about this passage before we pick up the conclusion of chapter 4. The spirit of glory and of God rests on those who suffer for the cause of Christ. We have not seen a lot of suffering in our country. It has mostly been verbal assaults. But for some time now, my second email address, which does not read peoplesharingjesus.com and does not in any way indicate that I am a pastor, I've been receiving every day a question designed to shake my faith. Every day. I open that email and I think, who all are getting these. Some question that disparages the truth and the reliability of the Word of God. Some question that disparages the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some question that disparages things that I've believed through the years and preached through the years. And I think to myself, how Satan has devised in this technological age a way to destroy the faith of believers. Now they don't know I'm a believer. They don't know that I'm a preacher of the gospel, but who else might be getting those same emails day after day after day? I believe that suffering will increase and intensify as time goes on. And we need to know that the spirit of glory and of God rests on us whenever we are challenged, when we are tested. And if we're going to suffer, then by all means, let it be for the right reasons. Don't suffer because you have behaved in a way that is ungodly, but suffer instead because of your faith. I have often said, if your faith is never challenged, you must be a secret disciple. You must belong to the secret service in the kingdom of God. Because when our faith is real, and when people know our faith is real, it will be challenged. Now that business of judgment beginning at the house of God. And listen to this verse 18. If the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. If the righteous, who are we talking about there? You, if you're a Christian, me. If the righteous is scarcely saved, Saved. You know, some of us think 
I'm not picking on you, but it might be you. Some of us think God's mighty fortunate to have us on his team. And if that's your attitude, you need to get on your knees and ask God's forgiveness for your spiritual pride. It is a great hindrance to the life that God has called you to in Jesus Christ. You know that old term, saved by the skin of his teeth? Some of you have no idea where that came from. Did you know that Job 19.20 has that phrase? The skin of my teeth. The message here is that the most righteous believer that you have ever known, the, the one that walked most closely with the Lord that you've ever seen, is scarcely saved. If that doesn't humble you, I don't know what would. Scarcely saved, and in contrast, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Some people intone a a loving God would never send anybody to hell. (laughs) Jesus taught more about hell than anybody else in the Scripture. We don't understand the exceeding sinfulness of sin. And the desperate need that we all have for forgiveness. That's our problem. Peter understood it. And said, if the righteous scarcely be saved. What will happen with the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore let those who suffer according to God's will. Entrust their souls to a faithful creator. While doing good. Trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. Not your performance. Not your giftedness, whatever your gifting might be. Put all your trust, all your trust in the Lord. And He will lift you up.